Sam and praise team and uh, Laura and Caitlin for that solo. In the sport of track and field, they have relay races, and one of the most important things is passing the baton on. And literally, when you're running a relay race, uh, that person with the baton, they literally have to pass that baton to the next runner in a certain amount of space, and if they get out of that space, uh, they can be disqualified, or if when they're running and they don't pass on the baton, they're disqualified. And so what happens is, is they literally, a track and field coach will practice them hours and hours intentionally so they'll know how many steps they need to take and how the runner with the baton needs to place the baton. And then also, the runner fixing to get the baton knows how to put their hands so they can grab the baton so they can literally run the relay race to the best of their ability, without passing or dropping the baton. They want to pass the baton on, but it, what's amazing, if, if one drops it, the whole team is disqualified. And today we're in a series, we're looking at the church unstoppable, and we're looking at the intentional church in Acts 2, and they literally were intentionally in, pa in passing the baton on to the next generation because they did. And what we want to look at today is how we're to be in an intentional church. Now the word intentional means to be done with purpose. It means to consciously decide to do something. Hal Seed said, growing churches are intentional churches. And so we've got to be intentional in what God wants us to be about as a church. And so we're going to go to the best place I know to go. The first church. Okay, this is the church right after Jesus has left. We saw last week, he gave his last words. He said, hey, now you should be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And now we see what happens after that, after the Spirit comes. And so let's read Acts 2, verse 41 through 47. Now this is the day of Pentecost. We don't have time to read the passages before that. But Peter preaches. There's people there from all nations and tongues and languages, and he preaches the gospel. If you don't believe me, go read it. And it says in verse 41, So those who accepted or gladly received his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. So 3,000 people, just a measly 3,000 people, were saved through one service of preaching God's word. And they devoted themselves. Now they're talking about the church. Now these 3,000, over 3,000. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. And they sold their possessions and property and distributed them the proceeds to all, as anyone had need, had a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people, and every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. See, the New Testament church made a difference because they were intentional. If you're not intentional, you'll have no clear path, well, you'll have no clear direction, and you won't make a difference. But if we are intentional is what we want to talk about today, then we will have a clear direction and pathway to make a difference on our world. And truthfully, it's laid out very simply here how we can do that today. But see, the Lord wants us to be an intentional church. The Lord wants us to be intentional Christ followers. He wants us to be determined to know God more and more each day, to move away from casual Christianity, to move away from playing church. He wants us to be intentional about a relationship and taking it to the next level instead of getting so comfortable that we don't want to be moved out of our pew. See, the Lord wants our churches to make a difference. And so we need to know what to do. And he literally lays it out here today for us, what we need to do. And I don't know, but do you know that he wants to use you? I don't care where he has you. 
whether he has you in middle school, high school, elementary school, whether he has you retired, whether he has you in the workplace, he still wants to use you to make a difference in this world. And he wants you to use you here at this great church, Bethsaida, to fulfill his essentials. And so let me give you two main main essentials. There's a lot in this passage. We're even going to dive off into it tonight some more. But let me give you two main essentials that I see in this text. Number one is this. We want to see be seeing newcomers coming to Christ. That's what they were seeing. They were seeing newcomers coming to Christ. Not just here at the day of Pentecost. Yes, we see 3,000 saved and they were baptized. But you'll see them coming to know the Lord even later. Now what's amazing is the book of Acts can be summarized in three words. So how's that? <laughs> it's like this. We saw last week, Jesus went up. Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit come down, and then you see the people go out. Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit came down, and then the people went out. See, the members of this church here in Jerusalem had a positive impact. They were impacting their people. Look at what it says in verse 47 there. It says, they were having favor with what? All people. God was using them. Were they in a, a, a Christian nation, Christian city at that time? Uh-uh. It's just Roman rule. See, the church multiplied 26 times in this one day. They went from 120 members to 3,120 in one day. Now that's multiplication. See, that's what God wants. He wants to see God moving and people being saved daily. That's what it says in verse 47, isn't it? And every day the Lord added to them who were being what? Saved. How did that happen? They were living on mission and telling us, man, you, man, the greatest thing happened in my life. I gave my life to Christ and my life hasn't been the same. Jesus is risen from the dead. He really did. I saw him. My friends saw him, and I've given my life to him. And because of that, my life ought to be changed. See, we're to invite newcomers to come to know Christ. We're to be preaching and sharing a kingdom gospel. But you need to understand, there's a lot of gospels out there being preached today in America, and you may have actually bought into one of those gospels I'm fixing to share with you. There's a lot of people buying into this stuff. There's a lot of gospels being shared. And so I'm going to give you a list. I got this from Bill Hull, great man of God. Uh, God's been using for many years to disciple make. Uh, he's a pastor, a professor, been making disciples for many years. Let me give you these, these five different gospels that are being preached. Number one is this, a forgiveness gospel. You say, what's that? Well, you, you just need forgiveness. Just pray a prayer and be forgiven. Just pray a prayer and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Now, do we need forgiveness of sins? Yes, but a lot of what they're saying, just pray a prayer, get you some fire insurance, but following Christ is not optional. There is no need to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Just pray a prayer and get, a, get out a jail card. That's all you need. You'll be fine. There's a lot of people shucking that today. Just pray a prayer. Do you need to pray a prayer? Yes. Do you need forgiveness of sins? Yes. But if you think it's just praying a prayer so you can get forgiveness of sins and live whatever way you want, that is not the gospel. No. That's the forgiveness gospel. Then there are people who bought into the liberal social action gospel. They say, go help the needy. Go help the poor. Works is paramount. But true truth is optional. Are we to help the needy and poor? Yes, but that's not what dictates whether we have eternal life or not. Yes, after we come to know Christ, we ought to want to help people. Out. Yes, but that's not what saves us. Then we have the prosperity gospel. Name it, claim it, claim your rights. You're entitled to stuff. God wants you to be happy. It's a self-centered gospel. It's preached on the heresy and devil channel every single day. And some of you listen to that junk. What they're preaching is this. It's not what you can do for the kingdom, but it's what the kingdom can do for you. That's a prosperity gospel. That's not the gospel. It's no more the gospel 
than the forgiveness gospel. Then we have many in our churches that have bought into this, and I've already shared this with you, but they've bought into the consumer gospel or moral therapeutic deism. I'm going to be good, I'm going to feel good, I'm going to do good, and I'm going to believe good according to my standard, not according to God's standard. That's a consumer gospel. That's just like, I'm good, I go to church. Going to church does not make me a Christ follower any more than going to Chick-fil-A makes me a chicken sandwich. Okay? And we have people in our churches everywhere in this land that have bought into that. I'm good, I'm okay. That's not the gospel. That's the consumer gospel. That's man-centered, man-oriented. What is the gospel? Well, I believe the gospel is the kingdom gospel. What did Jesus always talk about? The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. But he didn't talk about it as a future reality. He talked about it as present reality. That we can live the kingdom. We can live for Him. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, the kingdom of God is near. And then He says what? Repent and believe the good news. Believe the gospel. Now look at what Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. He says, For you are saved by grace through faith, And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. It's the gift of God. Not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are what His creation, His masterpiece, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time, so that we should walk in them. Now this is the truth you need to get here. You are saved from something, but you're also saved for something. We're saved from what? Our sins. Yes, we do need. We need Christ's atonement. We need forgiveness of sins. We need repentance. We have to put our faith in Him. But you're saved and given eternal life. But you're not just saved so you can sit in the pew and do nothing. No, you're saved for something. Because if you weren't saved for something, you'd get saved here and we'd be gone. There would be no need to be here. But see, the gospel is about changing your life. It's about, hey, once you come to know Him, it's about experiencing this victorious life. So you've been saved to serve. See, following Jesus is about learning about Him and living for Him. See, every Christ follower is a disciple of the King. See, Jesus wants to do more than just cancel your sin. He wants to control your life. See, Jesus is to rule and reign over your life because when you give your life to Him, you're surrendering Him. That's what lordship means. You're coming under Him saying, all right, Lord, you reign over my life. You're my king. You're my Lord. I want to follow you. That's what the gospel is. It's just not some little ditty transition. You walk down the aisle, sign a card, and live whatever way you want to. If that's what you think it is, you have bought into a false gospel, and many people have in our churches. really have. And Jesus is going to say, I don't know you. But Jesus, we went to church and we did all this stuff. I prayed a little ditty prayer. And he says, no, that's not what it's about. See, you've been saved to serve, not sit and soak. You should be an inviting member. That's what they were doing. How are these people getting saved every day? They were an attractive church. They were a multiplying church. They were inviting church. As we talked about last week, we're to be witnesses everywhere. Jesus said in Luke 14, 23, He says, Then the Master told the slave, Go out into the highways and lanes and byways and make them come in. Compel them so that my house may be filled. Why? So they can hear the gospel. C.S. Lewis said this, The church exists for nothing else but to draw men to Christ and to make them into little Christ. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became a man for no other purpose, to save you and then to, to use you so that you'll make an impact in others. See, the gospel came for you, 
not so you could hoard it, so that you might share it with others. According to a recent survey, 2,000 unchurched Americans, unchurched Americans, these people don't go to church, don't know the Lord, were surveyed by Lifeway Research and Billy Graham Evangelism, Center of Evangelism, and they give us some interesting news. A full 79% of unchurched Americans said this, if a friend of mine really values their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. That's good news. See, unchurched Americans aren't hostile to faith. They just don't think church is for them. Plus, they run into some people that go to church that live like the world, or they're about as boring as watching nails rust. But the good news is, is they're interested, they're not going to buck up. Even in our culture that is rapidly changing, they're at least still open to hear what you're sharing. And remember what I shared last week, 82% of those unchurched, if you would invite them to church, they would come today. 82% of them said, if a friend would invite me to church, I would go. That's still good news. So how did I do that? Just use one of those invite cards. Simple as that. Man, I'd love to invite you to our church. Man, we've got some great people down there. We're not perfect. But just love to invite you to come. See if that's what the Lord wants for you. Simple as that. You never know how that might start the conversation. And you might get to lead one of your friends, one of your family. Somebody you don't even know, you never know. What that tells us is, is, yes, we live in a changing culture, but still, at least they're not hostile. And they're at least still open to hearing. See, if we don't do this, I'm telling you, churches that are not focused on the gospel, don't really care about doing evangelism, you know what's going to happen? They're going to be closing their doors. Churches are already closing their doors, and they will close their doors. Because they're not doing what God's told them to do. So, number one, we want to see newcomers come to Christ. That's it. Man, that's the greatest thing. Seeing people transferred from Satan's kingdom, darkness into light of His Son. Number two, also see seeing your members growing in Christ. First, we see newcomers, but then in this church, we're seeing members growing in Christ. See, growing should be daily. You need to understand, discipleship does not happen accidentally. It happens intentionally. You intentionally decide to pour into someone. You intentionally decide to disciple one. You intentionally decide, hey, I'm going to get in my word. I'm intentionally going to try to share my faith with someone. It's intentional. It just doesn't happen by accident. You have to be intentional and decide, I'm going to do this. That's what this church did. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching every day. They continued steadfastly in the Word of God. Verse 44, those who believed were together on a daily basis. Every day, verse 46, they met together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. Verse 47, it says they praised God daily. And then we see that, hey, people were getting saved daily. Warren Wiersbe said this, the Christians you meet in the book of Acts were not content to meet once a week for service as usual. But they met what? Daily. They cared daily. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily and increased in numbers daily. Their Christian faith was a day-to-day reality, not a once-a-week routine. Why? Because the risen Christ was a living reality to them and his resurrection powers at work in their lives through the Spirit. I mean, so many people in, in America have just bought into churches. It's just a one-day thing. Church ain't a one-day thing. Well, this is not about church. It's about your relationship with Jesus. That's what it's about. And so I want to give you what I see in this text, five key elements in a church member. 
Some of you have heard this, some of you, some of you have all heard this, but I'm going to basically give you a couple, I'm going to give you five elements that I basically share in our Discover Best Seda class. If you want to become a member, I want to share with you five expectations of a church member because I see them right here in the text. Number one, you should be an attending member. And these people were faithful. They were meeting day to day. Baptists couldn't do that, man. They would, they would gripe like you wouldn't believe. But they were faithful. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying you ought to be in God's house. You ought to be in Sunday school. You ought to be in life group. You ought to be growing. You ought to be here every week unless you're detained to work. You're sick. There's emergency or vacation. Now, some people take permanent vacation. That's not what I'm talking about. But see, Hebrews tells us, hey man, we're to come in order, we're to stir up the love and promote good works among one another. Why? And to exhort one another so much more as we see the day approaching. What does that mean? Hey, Jesus is coming back someday and we need to encourage one another. It ought to, we ought to see this as a time of coming and enjoy being with our brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know about you. I love coming. You say, Brad, you, 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 get, you like it because you get paid. Shut no, I come for free. I did before I came called in the ministry. Yes, I love what I do, but that's because God called me to do it. But the thing is, I love being around brothers and sisters. I love meeting new members. I love meeting guests. Oh, man, that's somebody you've been praying for. They finally came to show. Man, that's who I love to meet. Because you've been investing in them. See, man, this church was a loving and praying church. They love coming together. Number two, you should be a giving member. Man, this church was caring, giving. They sold stuff to help one another out. And you know what I'm going to say? I believe every member ought to tithe. Yes, I do. Because it's scriptural. Because I promise you, if you'll trust God with the 10%, He'll do a whole lot better with the 90% than you can. <laughs> and literally, if you don't believe me, just go back to Malachi Verse chapter 3, verse 8 and 10, he says, all right, the only place God ever says, test me, try me, prove me, is in this area of giving. And he says, all right, just, just big boy, test me in this area. And watch, if you'll be faithful in this area, I'll pour out more blessings on you than you can imagine. And so we should be giving members because God has called us to give. Number three, you should be a growing member. These people are spiritually growing. They were growing, as Peter said, may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Man, I believe these people had a John the Baptist kind of uh, uh, mentality. He must increase and I must decrease. Paul told his young protege, Timothy, he says, man, rather train yourself for what? Godliness. See, we're to be growing. We don't... Bless God. It's not about putting it on cruise. I don't want to ever put it on cruise control. I'm learning stuff. You say, well, you've been read through the Bible. Mentioned. I'm still learning stuff. And I won't ever learn it all. One, I don't have a photographic memory. <laughs> so I have to keep going over and over to kind of be reminded of it. But I don't know everything in these 31,000 plus verses. So I'm to continually be growing. The only way to be a leader is to be a learner. And you want to be a leader in your home? you got to be a learner. I don't like it. Tough. Scripture. These people are growing. Number four, you should be a serving member. Man, these people are serving. You were created and saved to serve God. God has gifted you with gifts and talents. I believe every one of you has a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts. 1 Peter 4 says that each one has received a gift. You're to, you're to minister it. You're, you're to be a steward of it to God. See, God has given us all different gifts, and, we, and He brings us all and gathers us into this body, and, and we're to use them all so that the body will be full and the body can be healthy and the body can be strong to impact this world. And that's what this church was doing. God has literally given us gifts. 
and we're to use them. Don't believe me? Go read Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 this afternoon. It talks about how God gives ministry gifts to people for what? He gives apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers for what? For the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. What does that mean? We all do the work. We're all doing the work. We're all doing the work. And so we're to be serving. Number five, you should be an accountable member. What do you mean by that, accountable? If you read here in Acts, the believers were together, it was mentioned at least five times in the first four chapters. Acts 1.15, Acts 2.1, Acts 2.44, 2.47, and then 4.26. You see that they were together. What is that a picture of? That's a picture of unity. Not uniformity, but unity. They had a spiritual unity and oneness around the gospel of Jesus Christ. And see, what we're to strive to do is to promote the unity of the gospel here. That's what any church is supposed to do. We're to love one another. We're to encourage one another. We're to be there for one another. If you don't believe me, read Scripture in the New Testament. There's 59 one another's in the New Testament. And one of them isn't gossip about one another. Okay? It's about encouraging one another. Jesus said three times, John 13, 45, 34 through 35 says three com- times, and I give you a new commandment, that you what? Love one another. And how many times did he tell these? Three times. Love one another just as I've loved you, that you also love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. It's about that. What unity they had. Look at verse 46. What unity? Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together. They loved hanging out together. And that's one of the great things I love about it. Y'all love hanging out together. I have literally preached in churches. It's like, I don't even know why y'all go to church here. Because y'all don't even like hanging out together. I mean, I preached one sermon. I won't go there and tell you what was in that sermon, but I actually preached a sermon. And God dealt with a sin in the house. And they were out, we had closed the lights and shut the doors in less than five minutes. In most Sundays, we were out the door and closed the lights in ten minutes or less. That's not what church is. I, lo- I love y'all, man. We, we hang around, we're talking, we'll be out in the parking lot. You know, that's what, that's what we're... We come together to encourage one another because then we're going to go scatter and we're going out into the world. And so, that's why we need one another. It says they, what, ate, ate their food with a joyful and humble... They, they loved hanging out together. What were they doing? They did life together. That's what we're doing here. If you haven't figured this out, we're doing life together. And God wants to use us all to make a difference in this world. Adrian Rogers said it like this, referring to the New Testament church, the church was not rusted together by traditionalism. They were not wired together by organization. They were not frozen together, which some are, by formalism. They were melted and brought together by prayer, praise, and the power of the Holy Spirit. See, God wanted them involved in ministry. Just like He wants you involved in ministry. God wants you involved in biblical community, and I'll talk about that tonight. But God wants us actively reaching out too. God wants His church growing spiritually. God wants His church to be a disciple-making church. See, Jesus was intentional in His discipleship of His disciples. Say, what do you mean? share with you very quickly how he was intentional. If you go through the Gospels, you'll see this. Jesus ministered in the beginning and the disciples watched. Next, Jesus allowed the disciples to assist him in ministry. Then the disciples ministered and Jesus assisted. 
And then last, Jesus observed while the disciples did the ministry. Jesus was intentional about everything He did. If we'll be intentional as Christ followers, hey, we'll have a clear direction, we'll have a clear pathway, we'll realize, hey, I'm to strive to encourage and reach newcomers, but then I'm to grow and our church is to be doing the same thing. See, God has given us a baton. And the thing is, what are you going to pass down to the next generation? What are you going to leave behind? Well, I'm going to leave behind a legacy of money and possessions. Well, praise God. What are you going to leave behind that's worth of anything of eternal value? See, God says, I want you to pass the baton to the next generation. I want you to be concerned about the next generation because eventually there's going to be a graduation and we're going to heaven, but there's going to be people left behind if Jesus doesn't come. And we just said, God didn't say, just put up a camp and put up a tent and don't worry about anything. No, he said, hey, I want you to be intentional. And I want you to understand, I want you to pass the baton. And I want you to be an intentional church. And he says, and I want you to be an intentional Christ follower. Let's pray.